So that's all really well and interesting, but this is really where it, it comes down to how it is relevant to us. So um, this stuff, the eye is an analogy for a camera and vice versa. Really what we are doing in cameras is very similar to what our eye is doing when we are viewing a scene. We are focusing, we are inputting light from a scene, we are focusing it using some lens, and we are capturing it using some means of capturing the light. So just like uh, our lens focuses the light, our camera lens will focus the light, and uh, just like our, um, our fovea will capture the, the detail in a particular scene, so will our sensor. Though a sensor is much more uniform than the, than, uh, the fovea of our eye, or than the, than the back of our eye, rather, and, and will detect uh, the amount of, uh, it would look really weird if really only the middle part of an image had all the detail and all the outside didn't. Um, but anyway, when, when I was talking about photons and how increasing or decreasing the number of photons will actually increase or decrease the amount of light in the scene, this directly impacts us as photographers. And we have this concept of, um, of EV or exposure value where we, have, we measure how bright something is uh, in relative terms by using a term called stop. So when we are talking about one stop brighter or one stop darker, we are talking about literally having or doubling the amount of light and therefore the number of photons that are in the scene. So if we double the number of photons in a particular scene, we can make it twice as bright for the camera. So it doesn't look to be twice as bright to us because the way that we perceive brightness is, is not, it's not linear, it's not a one-to-one -one relationship, it's actually very, very skewed in, in this, uh, in this almost logarithmic looking uh, graph. But a camera is very literal when it is taking and recording photons from a scene. So if we have a well-exposed scene, uh, and it looks a little bit dark here because of the projector, but it's, 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 um, this is from the photo, the pinhole photo from the first lecture, as you remember, uh, which you can view on the Flickr group site if you are so interested in. Uh, we can also increase the exposure by one or two stops which therefore means that we had twice one times or rather twice as many photons or twice and twice so four times as many photons as the original scene um, and so uh, a camera sensor is very sensitive to the number of photons that it can read there's a very hard limit on the fewest number of photons that it can read and the most number of photons that it can read. Once you've gone outside of that range, then you were either completely underexposed, that there's no data when there's you know, a lack of photons or there's not enough photons for it to capture detail, or you've gone the other direction and you're overexposed. And so, as we can see in this photo, this photo is looking a little bit overexposed because whereas before we could see some detail, for example, there's, I mean, there's a little bit of writing here on this page, it is now completely obliterated over here and so there's details additionally in the background that have now been obliterated they look completely white they've been blown out so to speak or they've been overexposed uh, because we weren't carefully measuring the photons that are entering into the camera and luckily the camera will do a lot of this calculating for us we don't actually have to know okay my camera can read three photons up to about uh, 25,000 so that means that I have to convert that number to some shutter speed or something like that. No, luckily uh, the camera will do a lot of that for us. But overexposing or underexposing a photo is a bad thing. It's probably one of the worst things you can do for your photograph because you will lose that data and you will never be able to get it back. So in this case, um, this isn't three different photos. This is actually one photo where it's been increased in exposure using software just for uh, demonstration purposes. But it's used, I use the same one because it's, it's easy then to spot the differences from one photo to the next. But there's a variety of ways that we can limit or enhance, well we can't really enhance the number of photons, but we can either limit or not limit the number of photons that enter into our camera. And this is the topic of not only the rest of today's lecture, but also the next lecture as well, and that is dealing with, sh with exposure, and in today's lecture, shutter speed. So shutter speed is, remember the speed through which the shutter is open, exposes the sensor, and then it closes. And if you remember the video from last time, it was pretty quick. It was a very, it was a very slow motion video of 
of, uh, of a mirror going up and then a shutter opening and then closing. And we actually can define how much time that shutter is open and how much time that light is able to hit the sensor. And remember that whenever we double or have the light, we are making it twice as bright or half as bright, respectively. So therefore, we can affect the exposure by doubling or having the shutter speed. Because if we double the amount of time that the shutter is open, then we are doubling the number of photons that are able to hit it, and therefore we are making it one stop brighter. So when you are adjusting exposure on your camera, one of the options you have is shutter speed. And whenever you have or double the shutter speed, you are, you are increasing by one stop or decreasing by one stop, um, <coughs> excuse me, respectively. And uh, there are a variety of, of shutters that are available. So we did see a horizontal plane shutters where it was, it was two shutters that moved in sort of synchronous motion down the sensor from the videos from last time. But there are others available as well, particularly in the film days. We had some that went across, uh, uh, it was oriented vertically. And even in some of the larger format cameras, we have what are called leaf shutters where it's sort of, it sort of closed and then it opens like sort of like a, sort of like an aperture which we'll talk about uh, next time but it's sort of it's like a closed uh, aperture and then all of a sudden it opens up allowing more light to be captured in and so uh, when we're talking about exposure in photographs it's usually a very interesting thing to talk about how long an image was exposed because this tells us quite a bit about the image. So in this case, for example, this was the pinhole photo, and this had an exposure time of 602 seconds. So just over 10 minutes was the shutter open and collecting photons. So this, that's actually quite a long time for a camera to be collecting photons, but, uh, and, and we'll talk about this later, but it's because we were really restricting the amount of light elsewhere. Um, so this is made possible, so usually when you're adjusting the shutter speed on your camera, you're given a variety of options. So you might have something as fast as maybe one eight thousandth of a second or one four thousandth of a second, which is really fast, really, really fast. But usually you can only go as slow as about 30 seconds. And when I'm talking about fast and slow, uh, one eight thousandth of a second, that's how long that shutter is open. That's not open for a very long time at all. But being open for 30 seconds, that's a long time for you, for you to have to stand there and hold the camera to be still. Um, so if 30 seconds isn't slow enough for you, which it obviously wasn't in the case of this pinhole camera uh, or in this pinhole photo, you can use what some cameras have, which is called a bulb mode. And uh, the bulb mode allows you to take a photo for as long as you are holding down the shutter. And uh, you, you'll remember that I wasn't holding down the shutter, but there are some remotes that allow you to actually uh, lock the shutter open until you're ready to close it. And that's ex exactly what I did. I had a remote connected to it and I locked the shutter open so it was in bulb mode, collecting all of those photons through the pinhole. Uh, and then when the timer was up, we just turned off the shutter and then it closed and uh, did the final calculations when saving the photo. So you'll notice that there is a particular effect that we can see with this photo. And that is that everything is blurry, 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 and fuzzy, fuzzy, fuzzy. And that is because of motion blur. So one of the effects of shutter speed on a photo is motion blur, where the longer that it is open and collecting photons, the fuzzier things will tend to be, especially things that are in motion. Because uh, you can imagine uh, if we have a, um, let's see, this is, it's always hard to come up with analogy for this, but if light is, is coming from one particular spot and you open the shutter and then you move that light, now that light has actually been moved across the sensor and so it will actually appear to be a streak on the sensor rather than just one solid block of light. And so this is very apparent to us when we are adjusting shutter speed uh, on our cameras. And in fact, that's one of the reasons why this photo is so blurry because at 10 minutes, you folks were moving around a lot. And so the details in your faces, for example, uh, were, were actually changed uh, or were actually blurred out quite a bit just by your simple motions. And this is one reason why a tripod is so important is that if you have a shutter speed that is at all not very quick, uh, then you are going to need some way of sturdying or stabilizing the camera so that it doesn't move. And remember that these pixels, 
are very, very, very small in a camera, and they're smaller than a human hair. So if you move your camera, even just a human hair's amount in the time that that shutter speed or that that shutter is open, you could get motion blur within the image, even if it is very slight. But this is sometimes an effect that we want. So sometimes you want to be able to have the shutter open for a long period of time and get motion and movement within it. So fireworks, for example, is one thing that you really want to see the motion of the fireworks. If you take fireworks photos uh, with, a, with a typical camera, sometimes it will try to make the shutter speed too fast so that you only see a very small part of the firework. You don't see its motion. And usually what you want in fireworks are motion so that you can actually see the, uh, the fireworks moving throughout the frame. So you want to have a couple of seconds maybe of time where the shutter is open uh, so, that you can, uh, uh, so that you can capture that sort of effect. And if you notice, and from now on I'll be, I'll be posting exposure values um, for all of these photos in the lower left hand corner so that you can see if you're interested. This photo uh, had an exposure value of 10 seconds. And so luckily, these other things are relatively um, sharp because they didn't move very much in that 10 seconds. So relatively, they have stayed still while the fireworks instead have moved. And um, this, uh, oh, oh and, and, and another thing about fireworks before I forget, um, it's really tough to get good fireworks photos unless you have a lot of wind and a lot and a really, really stable tripod. Because when you take a long exposure, and a long exposure meaning a shutter speed of you know, several seconds or more, uh, when you take a long exposure of, of fireworks, you usually have smoke to deal with as well. And that can really ruin a photograph. And, and usually when you have relatively high winds that it can push the smoke out of the way quickly, that's usually when you will get the best uh, fireworks. But also wind pushing will also push your camera. So that's a bad thing as well. So you need a good sturdy tripod, uh, one that you can weigh down maybe by, by adding some additional weight on the middle, for example, to give it some additional stability and then make sure that it doesn't sway as much in the wind. Because remember, I, I told you that if you move it even so much as the width of one human hair, you will get potentially motion blur within your images. But it's more than just fireworks that you might want to use uh, long exposures. You might also want to do it for moving water as well. So water, still water is kind of cool, but one of the best effects is when you can get this really sort of milky white water that can result from a very long exposure. Uh, was there a question? Yeah, I was wondering, is there any, is there any fear of damaging the sensor if you leave the shutter open for too long? Is there any fear of damaging the sensor if you leave the shutter for, open for too long? No, not that I know of. Um, the worst thing that can really happen, uh, well, there's, there's a couple things that happen. When it's open and, and reading light, it's generating heat. So in, in very hot environments, this can be a problem because heat will cause artifacts on the screen. Um, but the other problem is that long exposure shots will sometimes, you'll also sometimes get what are called hot pixels. So it's one or two pixels on the, on the, uh, on the image that are completely red or completely blue and it looks very, very much out of place. Um, but usually that's what those um, uh, noise, oh no, no, what is it called? It's long exposure correction or long exposure reduction or something like that. Most cameras have a feature uh, that also takes a similarly long photo with the shutter closed so that it can read the same hot pixels in a completely black frame and it just subtracts out those hot pixels from the original photo. Uh, so for very long exposures, that's usually the only thing you have to contend with. And particularly when you're taking photos for, of astrophotography, for example, where you may be dealing with photos that, are, uh, that have shutter speeds of hours or, or you know, well, several hours is, is a pretty long time, but um, then that will become an issue there. But I don't think you have to worry about, uh, or battery drainage as well, that's another problem, but you don't really have to worry about it damaging the sensor necessarily. Um, so getting some uh, motion in the frame can actually be very visually interesting. So for example, you can get a very milky white stream of water, for example. And so in this case, I wish that I had been able to, uh, uh, to capture a longer shutter speed. But as you can imagine, this, well, this shutter speed was only two seconds. But as you can imagine, when you're dealing with a very, very bright situation where there's lots of light coming down, it's difficult to try to keep the shutter open for longer because you run into that problem I described before where you can't, you simply cannot put too much light into the sensor, otherwise it will just 
completely overexposed. It will be completely, um, uh, completely overexposed. But on the other hand, sometimes you want to completely stop motion as well. And you can use a very fast shutter speed for this. And usually you want to do this for things such as sports. So when you really want to freeze the action and see you know, how, you know, how crazy the people contort their faces or how much the ball has become oblonged by their kicking it, for example, uh, usually want to get as fast of a shutter speed as you possibly can. So in this case, this was a shutter speed of 1 1,250th of a second. So that's 1 over 1,250, which is a pretty quick time when taking a photo. Uh, and so for sports, this is the general case. You're going to want to stop action as much as possible for sports. That means increasing the shutter speed, which, and when I say increasing, I mean making it faster. Uh, so uh, as much as possible. And even for this, it, it might actually be worthwhile to have a tripod because when you're following people uh, that are moving very, very quickly, uh, it, you don't want to introduce additional movement into the camera. Even at 1,250th 1, of a second, the camera was still moving a little bit because I was you know, panning to follow these players as this photo was taken. And so having a tripod or even a monopod for sports photos is sometimes advantageous there as well. Was yes? Really bright out? Was that like noontime or this, uh, this wasn't noontime. It does help. Yes, so it, it does help um, because there's more than just shutter speed that affects exposure. And we'll talk about the rest the next time. Um, but the more light you have, the more opportunity you have to make a shutter speed faster. So in this case, it could be this quick because it was outside. It was midday, even though I think it was overcast. And actually being overcast and midday is one of the best times to take sports photos because one of the things you notice is that there are no harsh shadows. There's no harsh light on the players. It's very diffuse light. It's very soft light, which really um, helps the, the photograph, any photograph really. Um, so having lighting conditions like that was, was nearly ideal for, for a photo such as this. However, there are some occasions, even in sports, where you don't want to freeze all of the action. Sometimes you want to do a mixture of both freezing the action of the important bits and giving the perception of motion elsewhere. And you can do this with sort of a, 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 moderately, a moderate length shutter speed and a very steady hand. So if, if in this case, this was a car that was moving by very, very quickly, and at only 1 320th of a second, as it moved by, uh, when, you are open, when you open the shutter and you're taking the photo, as long as you keep following the object that's moving, then the center part will remain sharp, while the other part, the other, par the other portions of the image that, are, that you were not following will appear blurry because there is some movement while that shutter is open. So mixing these two is actually a really neat but also kind of difficult thing to do because uh, not only are you moving it left and right, but you're almost guaranteed to be kind of moving it up and down a little bit or shaking it in some way. And so if you're seeing some motion uh, horizontally, there's almost probably some motion vertically as well. And there are some exceptions to this um, that we will, of course, talk about at a later thing. You'll notice that is one, sort of one of the big things is that we build up a lot of this material and I tease you with a lot of it, but eventually by the end you will, you will feel relief in that you will know all of this material. And so there is a way to help combat this additional vibration vertically here, and I'll give you a hint, it's, uh, it's uh, image stabilization, um, but you can still get this sort of lateral motion that exists. And so pretty much anything where you, you uh, selectively are able to keep portions of the frame um, absolutely sharp in focus. And that means not moving the camera at all relative to those portions in the frame, you can get some really neat effects. So here, for example, by strapping down your tripod very, very tightly into your passenger seat, can you take a photo where pretty much all of the dashboard of your car is uh, still it looks sharp and it's still, but everything else outside is moving. And so this was uh, a 2.5 second exposure that, so it was open for that long and luckily it was tied down sharp, it was, it was, the tripod was tied down enough that the rest was able to be in sharp focus. And so having this sort of context uh, for having um, 
uh, when you have motion blur and something else that's also sharp in the image, can, can make for a very visually appealing image. And so um, this is, though, uh, not only somewhat difficult to do, but uh, you also don't want to move the tripod at all because if you get uh, any motion blur at all, so if, if I had hit the tripod, for example, or been unlucky and hit a pothole or something, then all of these portions would then appear blurry because it would have just bounced ever so slightly just enough to do it. And so it's, there's a very fine line between having uh, acceptable motion blur uh, and having unacceptable motion blur, at least for, from, from my perspective. And I think having some bits uh, within the image to, to ground you uh, in terms of the context helps a lot. So if the same image had been completely blurry, I don't think it would be as interesting or as successful because then it's just another blurry photo among a sea of, of blurry photos. <clears throat> so in general, motion blur is, is, is bad because uh, you are usually getting rid of details that you want to keep. So in this case, uh, yeah, it would have been nice to have all the details throughout this image and the motion blur wasn't a bad thing. But it can be a good thing depending on the particular effect that you want to have, whether it be fireworks, water, even sports, or even just some sort of artsy pick doesn't really matter. But um, really, when you stop the motion, that is how um, you can really get some, some good sports photos, as I said. So uh, although I've shown you a lot of, of, of photos where motion blur has been mixed into it, a lot of times you actually want to eliminate uh, motion blur as much as possible. And so that means having a lot of light and having a very fast shutter speed. And so um, this, in this case, this was one that's at one one thousandth of a second. And it was fast enough to actually capture droplets of water that are falling off of the raft. And so it it's, makes for uh, a, a visually appealing. And, and though I could argue that, sure, having a little bit of motion blur as, in, as that car had in it, uh, might also be visually appealing. There's, you know, you, you need to use your judgment and try different things and learn your own particular style. And so, uh, but to make some of this shutter speed, some of these shutter speed values a little bit more concrete, um, in general, when you are taking a look at shutter speed, so let's say your camera reports to you that it wants to take a photo at a shutter speed of 1 60th of a second, for example. Um, now that is what it is. That's a pretty fast time. It's not fast enough to stop all motion, obviously, but it's, it's a pretty good time. Generally, when you are looking through your camera's lens and you're about to take a photo, you should try to think about that shutter speed and the focal length of your lens. And so we'll, we'll talk about focal length, of course, as always in a later lecture. Um, but if you have a focal length of about 60 millimeters and you can look on your lens to see what the focal length range is, <coughs> excuse me, and when I'm talking about focal length here, I'm talking about on SLR cameras. Uh, digital cameras or smaller compact cameras do have focal length ranges, but they're much, much smaller. So it's harder to do the same calculation. But on SLR cameras, the general rule is one over the focal length is the slowest shutter speed that you can take a reasonably sharp photograph. So at 1 60th of a second, I can use a 60 millimeter lens, for example, and get a pretty fast or get a pretty good pretty sharp photo. But if I were using a 70 millimeter lens or a 200 millimeter lens, using 1 60th of a second isn't going to probably, is probably not going to be fast enough. And the reason for that is that when we're, when we're looking through, uh, through these lenses, longer focal lengths are more zoomed in. So the more zoomed in you are, the harder it is to keep the camera still. So that's something to, to keep in mind. But when we're talking about 1 60th of a second, let's say that I have maybe a hundred millimeter lens on my camera, what, how can I, how many stops should I adjust that to get a reasonably sharp photo? So from 1 60th of a second, I could double it or have it, each of which is a stop. If I double it, what will the shutter speed be? Right, well, well, doubling technically is 1 30th. So doubling it is, is tech, because when you, when you were doubling the shutter speed, you're making it slower. And remember that the, the smaller number on the bottom of the, of the fraction will mean a slower number. So 1 30th is a slower time. So what I actually need to do is make it one stop faster. So do about 1 120th of a second. 
And this is possible um, to do. There's, I've, like I've been alluding to, there's more than just shutter speed when we're talking about exposure values. So you can adjust more than just the shutter speed when you need to try to keep the light within the permissible range of the sensor, but you need to get some particular exposure value. So whether it be shutter speed, aperture, or ISO to achieve the end result that you want. And so how we will adjust all of these things, we will talk about next week. So thank you all for coming, and we will, we will see you next week when we continue talking about exposure values. <laughs>